welcome everyone. Uh, fantastic to see that you have all um, chosen to join us today on such a packed and exciting agenda that this conference provides. So I thought I would start with just introduce who we are, the organizers behind this particular event. So the Forest and Farm Facility is a global program uh, operating currently in 10 different countries in Asia, Africa and Latin America. It is um, a funding facility that provides direct financial support and technical assistance to strengthen forest and farm producer organizations who represent smallholder farmers, rural women's groups, local communities, and indigenous people's institutions globally. And so collectively, we call these um, members of these different organizations, forest and farm producer organizations, or FFPOs, which I'm sure that you will hear throughout the event. So in case there are any confusions, this is what we mean. So it's a global program and a partnership. And so in this partnership, you have the Food and Agriculture Organizations of the United Nations. You have International Institute for the Environment and Development, which is my organization where I come from. Um, you also have the International Union for Conservation of Nature and Natural Resources. And then you have AgriCord, which is a EU agri-agency organizations which work with organizations, farmers organizations, not just in the EU, but globally. Also in this event, we have Asia Dara joining us. So Asia Dara is a member of AgriCord. It is a regional partnership of 11 social development networks and organizations in 11 countries in Asia. We also have the Vietnam National Farmers Union, which is a core partner of the Forest and Farm Facility, but it is also a, a major farmers organization in uh, Vietnam representing more than 10 million farmers and forest producers. So in this event, we're covering some quite big concepts, um, multidimensional resilience and nature-based solutions are quite a mouthful in itself so i thought perhaps we need to explain a little bit what we mean with this so multidimensional resilience well resilience basically refers to the ability of societies and nature to adapt to and manage the effects of stress and shocks so the current covid19 pandemic is a typical example of the uh, current health and economic crisis that we're in. But then of course, we also have the ongoing climate change and biodiversity crisis. And so increasingly during this time, we're noticing how important it is to have a diversity of solutions to solve these combined societal and environmental challenges. So resilience is this highly diverse adaptive capacity to manage these risks and stresses. When we talk about nature-based solutions, one of the key agents um, behind this problem solving, not uh, just to these multidimensional crises, but perhaps to the everyday challenges we need to face in our societies anyway, are the local organizations of forest and farm producers. So they employ a host of nature-based solutions that is actions to protect, manage, and restore natural or modified ecosystems, which address societal challenges and provides well-being for both humans and nature. So these are some of the aspects we hope to cover, but also to show in practice what they look like and what they mean on the ground in this event. So some of the key objectives, what are we, uh, hoping to achieve. So first of all, we would like to show you through a set of different case studies how uh, diverse forms of forest and farm producer organizations use the different approaches to deliver nature-based solutions that support nature and people. 
we like to show how these forest and farm producer organizations can partner with governments and other actors to integrate diverse production models and sustainability into the trade of forest and farm products at scale. So we're not talking about small solutions at individual levels and farm levels, we're looking at entire landscapes. Finally, we'd like to look at how forest and farm producer organizations can be empowered to use and take advantage of new tools and standards that are emerging for assessing and monitoring nature-based solutions and therefore also communicate how they are being applied and what effect that has. So in order to um, demonstrate and reach these different objectives, we have a very interesting uh, panel of speakers and who will be presenting their different case studies and tools. So first off, we will have Nora Simula. She is um, a climate and forestry expert at the Food and Forest Development Organization in Finland, and she's representing AgriCode here today. For, she will give us um, a introduction to a global survey, which was carried out earlier this year uh, in an effort by um, AgriCord and in partnership with the Forest and Farm Facility to get the perspective of local forest and farm producers of risk and vulnerability in the current context of climate change and COVID-19. Following Nora, we will have Pauline Buffel. And um, Pauline Buffel um, will give us uh, she is a um, program officer within the Global Forest and Climate Change Program at IUCN. She will give us a useful overview of what nature-based solutions means, where it comes from and why, and importantly, key, the key role that rural, rural communities play in scaling them up. She will be uh, launching an exciting new web tool that shows uh, restoration potential, which is one of the nature-based solutions, and also the location of key uh, forest and farm producer organizations globally. So um, that will be exciting to see that giving the light of day to, for the first time today. Following Pauline, we will have our first set out of three exciting case studies. Nonoi uh, Villas from the uh, Asia Dara will present a case study of interesting uh, nature-based solutions based on mangrove forest restoration in the Philippines. After that, we will have Pam Tai Tang together with Vu Le Yvon from Thailand and the Vietnam, Vietnam National Farmers Union, who will give us um, a case study from uh, Vietnam um, showing us the uh, adoption of a quite a different approach to supporting uh, forest and farm producers uh, in scaling up nature-based solutions in partnership with the government. Uh, finally, uh, we will turn to Ecuador where um, we will have Virginia Vallejo Rojas joining us via video to present a case study from UNORCAC which is showing how organizations of indigenous forest and farm producers around a protected area is adopted a diversified value chain approach that is rooted in cultural identity, natural integrity, and farmers organizations to ensure the well-being of its members. And so throughout um, the event, we will have, I am sure, questions um, that you would like to direct to our different speakers. So I will ask you please to um, put them in the chat box and we will direct them and answer them as soon as we can. So um, without further ado delay, I will hand over to Nora, Nora Simula, who will give us um, our start of the day in looking into multidimensional resilience. Okay, thank you, Anna and uh, nice to see you all here. So my name is Nora Simola and I present AgriCord Alliance, which is one of the organizations belonging to the Forest and Farm Facility Partnership. 
AgriCord is a global alliance of non-governmental organizations or agri-agencies, as we call them, in five different continents. And uh, these agri-agencies, uh, they are mandated by farmers' organizations to support their peers in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. I myself work as a climate and forestry expert in one of the member agencies called FFD, but I work also in these matters for the whole alliance. Uh, I think that the, uh, you know, the first page, the cover page of my presentation demonstrates that the, there are plenty, many, many colorful logos, and we really believe that the real impact requires real co-effort and close partnerships. So my presentation today focuses on farm and forest producer organizations, FFPOs, uh, adopting nature-based solutions for multidimensional resilience. And uh, in this presentation, I would like to draw the attention to the potential that nature-based solutions may offer in terms of responding to the diverse resilience challenges of farmers and forest producers around the world. Next slide, please. Thank you. So farmers, forest, produ forest producers and other small scale producers have strength in numbers. Estimates vary a bit, but for example, FAO in 2015 estimated that there is around 1.6 billion smallholders in the world depending on forest and farm landscapes. These resource managers are many and they directly impact their lands, ecosystems and landscapes. They provide an important link in wider adoption of any nature-based solutions. And engaging them throughout the process in planning, in implementation, in monitoring, in evaluating nature-based solutions is crucial. Therefore, the organizations, I mean, you know, these smallholders, they, they many times scattered, also smallholder plots are scattered. So therefore, the organizations such as farmers and forest producers associations and cooperatives are in a key position. They present their members, they integrate them into landscape level planning processes, they mobilize smallholders small and their communities, they support their members in livelihood development and preparing for looming risks. Next slide, please. Thank you. So this year, talking about the risks, you know, this year we conduct a global survey on farmers and forest producers' resilience. Uh, these are the results from Africa and Asia, where 74 uh, forest and farm producer organizations replied from 24 different countries. One of the objectives uh, of this survey was to find out what forest and farm producers need to be resilient to. What are the main hazards affecting their livelihoods? So as you can see from the graphs, climate change was indicated as the number one risk. COVID-19 was the second and then came degradation of natural resources and especially soil erosion, deforestation and water shortage was specified by the respondents. Next slide, please. Thank you. So this is to say that there are several and varying resilience challenges faced by uh, smallholders. In general, the human and social impact of the most significant risks are severe, you know, including, including income insecurity, in increased poverty, food insecurity. And if you consider that the smallholders are currently affected by various challenges, included, including COVID-19 and climate change related hazards. So uh, the situation is quite severe. And the direct impacts again vary, you know, uh, making the picture more complicated. For example, COVID-19 caused problems, according to the survey, the COVID-19 caused problems in input supply, such as access to seeds. Uh, but also, for example, uh, in marketing of the products, 
Whereas then uh, many times, you know, the impact of climate change hit especially the products. Next slide, please. Therefore, FFPOs advocate for multidimensional resilience for their members that are vulnerable to various hazards and livelihood challenges. They need solutions that respond simultaneously to multiple social, economic and environmental challenges with different level of urgencies, but also different timescales and geographic extents. They need solutions that improve their livelihoods at all times. Also, solutions that simultaneously help them to cope with risks, support times in times of crises, such as, you know, buffering from, from uh, disasters and also recovering from crises. But also, uh, they need solutions that improve and sustain the functionality of ecosystems without forgetting the need for climate change mitigation. So, okay, nature-based solutions have potential to respond to these needs, but at the same time, we need to be realistic. These solutions, nature-based solutions, have to be clearly beneficial and relevant from the perspective of farmers and forest producers. The only way to sustain the buy-in of smallholders by the long run is to engage them in all parts of the process starting from the planning of these solutions. At the same time it's good to remember that smallholders are already operational in this field. In this global survey I mentioned before, 98% of the FFPOs indicated that they are already engaged in climate action. In addition, sustainable forest management agroforestry systems and many other ecosystem-based good practices are they business as usual. Next slide please. Thank you. So okay they are operational already but the question is how to scale up this effort, how to scale up the good practices. Uh, we need to expand the local good practices to landscape level initiatives. We need to expand the number of smallholders and communities benefiting from nature-based solutions. So, uh, what is what is shown by this uh, uh, this um, you know last slide is that the global survey indicated that scaling up requires especially capacity building of smallholders, long-term financing, and collaboration with other actors. And you know, these were indicated uh, in relation to both COVID-19 crisis and climate change crisis. So, you know, overall, there is definitely a momentum for scaling up, but it requires investment. Next slide, please. Thank you very much. And uh, now I would like to hand over to Pauline Buffel, IUCN. Yes, hello everyone. Um, I'm just going to be sharing my screen to be able to present to you a few uh, definitions and a few more details on the approach uh, that are nature-based solutions and some examples. Um, okay, excuse me. I need to the quality. Okay, never mind. Um, so, nature-based solutions. Um, you must be asking yourself, okay, uh, are we talking about new practices? Well, well, no. It's just put in words and descriptions to existing practices. But you can see here the evolution on how we came up with the nature-based solution standard. So, first of all, here we have the early IUCN origins and of other peers that are also present in, the, in this call, in this uh, presentation. We, we have found strong foundation in forest landscape restoration, ecosystem-based adaptation, ecosystem-based disaster risk reduction. 
um, and we started putting them under the umbrella of what we call nature-based solutions. Then the term nature-based solutions started appearing in some of our IUCN position papers uh, in the, at UNFCCC. In 2016, we came up with a formal definition. Then in 2017, the EU Horizon 2020 very strongly uh, picked up on our definition of NBS to uh, develop a, a multi-million uh, funding program. And finally, uh, after a long year of con and two rounds of public consultation, we launched a few weeks back the Nature-Based Solution Standard. And this standard is actually um, uh, supported by a self-assessment tool that I will be uh, presenting a bit later on. So internally in the conservation community, it has helped us change uh, the paradigm uh, to have a second pillar uh, in conservation practices. So the idea is that we still have, of course, conservation actions for safeguarding nature and biodiversity, but also to, admit, to address um, societal benefits, provide societal uh, benefits and while addressing specific challenges. Then, well, why create a new standard? Um, with the global momentum around nature-based solutions, uh, the, the approach ha has led to several misuses. And um, even when there were good intentions, but sometimes, for example, too much focus on nature maybe was at the expense of local communities or the opposite with too much focus on economic benefit or if, for example, carbon sequestration, then biodiversity benefits were not really taken into account. Therefore, clarifying the approach with a standard made it much easier to upscale and to extend the reach and the relevance of this type of, uh, of practices. And finally, in this context and for forest and farm producer organization, I think it is very good for communication purposes. And I think it is important for FFPOs to put a name on it when they are implementing NBS. So Anna went uh, already briefly, uh, this defined briefly the nature-based solution. So our official definitions are actions to protect, sustainably manage and restore natural or modified ecosystems that address societal challenges effectively and adaptively and simultaneously providing human well-being and biodiversity benefits. Um, as you can see here, we often describe NBS as a no regret option. So the, the main societal challenges that uh, the standard focuses on are uh, climate change adaptation and mitigation, disaster risk reduction, socioeconomic development, human health, food security, water security, and environmental degradation and biodiversity loss. So those seven challenges uh, can evolve. The standard is in constant evolution and will adapt uh, its relevance. Now, often we do get the question, okay, so what is the difference? Uh, what is, for example, is wind power a nature-based solution? So as I said, it's important that the nature-based solutions is really an ecosystem approach about restoring, protecting, or sustainably managing it, addressing societal challenge and with benefits both for society and nature. The example of nature-derived solutions like wind power or solar power, hydropower, well, it is using water and, and sun and, and wind, but it does not necessarily provide biodiversity benefits. Or then we have nature-inspired solutions. Well, here it's a very interesting example of the stenocara beetle in the arid African desert. So the beetle uses a part of node along its back to collect moisture, and then the droplets slide off the bumps of, the, of its back into its mouth. So academics are trying to mimic this structure of the beetle to develop uh, water harvesting in, in arid, uh, arid zones. But this is not also providing ecosystem and biodiversity benefits. So this is where we need to, to, to put a distinction. Um, so 
there are several, as I, I said, there are several uh, nature-based solutions that can be implemented. Here is um, an example of a large-scale assisted restoration in China that took place in 1994. So the societal challenge that it addressed was poverty and unemployment, but also degraded soils, pollution, and natural risk like dust storms. And the benefits, they, well, Again, because it's a nature-based solution, it addresses societal benefits, which is uh, improved household income, local employment rate, but also biodiversity and ecosystem service benefits with uh, increased vegeta vegetation cover um, with much more soil retention. So in FFF, in the forest and farm facility, we strongly believe that direct funding should be channeled to FFPOs to implement nature-based solutions like forest landscape restoration. That is why we have created this, this product. It's called a story map. So you can maybe use the QR code to access it directly or the website link. And it's really, it's, it's an advocacy piece uh, to show the value of forest and farm producer organization in forest landscape restoration. So among other things, we explain how among the 2 billion hectares around the world of degraded land with potential for restoration, a majority of it is on or adjacent to farmland. For example, in Asia, the potential is about 300 million hectares. So <clears throat> much of this land could be restored by, by interventions involving agroforestry, smallholder agriculture and buffer planting farmers would benefit from it by increased production, reduced erosion and enhanced food production. Um, the, here on this map you can see very well we try to show the value of engaging a forest and farm producer organization. So the green is where the, the Myanmar Farmer Federation is very active in Myanmar and the blue are the restoration opportunities that were assessed with the government and other stakeholders. So it is a matter of really overlaying the opportunities and the potential of the FFPOs to show their value. And this is really building on the scale of their constituencies. But of course, engaging them makes a lot of sense for other, other aspects. I mean, they have, they have the direct link with the land, whether they own it or not. They have the local and traditional knowledge about land use management and their understanding of the economic and political constraints for restoration is very useful and key in implementing forest landscape restoration. So another novelty that I would like to share today with you is actually the IUCN self-assessment tool that was developed to support the standard. So you have received it by email um, and you can again, uh, it should appear in the chat, you can open it there if you want to have a look. So what is the purpose of this tool? Well, it's to help design nature-based solutions, but also upscale and improve pilots by identifying gaps and area for improvements or assess past projects and future plans. Well, why should, do I advocate for forest and farm producer organization to use the self-assessment tool? Is because there's an increasing momentum both from donors and the private sector on NBS. And I think it would be a very strong communication and policy advocacy tool to show the value of smallholders, but also the value and the, the strength in number, numbers of producer organization to do it. So now I will just quickly go through the tool just for you to, to have an idea. So it's, it's a basic Excel sheet for now with all the instructions here. And it's all about, it's, it's built around the eight criteria. So the first one is, as I said, the entry point. It's about what kind of and how does it address societal challenge. Criteria two is the scale. Three, four, and five are the pillars of sustainability, which is like biodiversity and ecosystem benefits, economic and financially viable. And the fifth is the governance and societal aspects. 
because we cannot count on having a triple win, very strong triple win. There will necessarily be trade-offs and trade-offs also over time with the, an evolving situation. So it's also very important to be um, transparent on the type of trade-offs that, that had to happen. Criteria seven is about managing, it's about net NBS being uh, adaptive because ecosystems are dynamics, but also there is climate change and other aspects that need to be taken into account. So we need to be prepared that whatever our um, land use planning or NBS is, uh, is looking for, then we need to make sure that it's adaptive. Finally, criteria eight is more of the aspirational criteria, criterion. It's about mainstreaming it in, in policy, uh, in sectoral policies, and if possible, also grounding it into community-based governance or FFPO governance to ensure its durability. So I will zoom in a bit more, but for example, for criteria uh, three, you go in, in the Excel sheet, you look at the, apologies, so there's an indicator, guiding questions to help with the indicator. Then you can self-assess using this type of information to help you assess whether you are strong, adequate, partial, or insufficient. And then you'd put the rationale on why you actually uh, self-assess this way and the means of verification. So once you have filled in all of this, you, you come up with this page. So here, this, the, the spider web shows you, helps you show the results and it will help you show where you are strong, which you can then use um, uh, for communication and policy influencing or knowledge sharing and building the capacity of others. But you can also show, it also shows where maybe there's a lot of room for improvement. And that's really useful and it's in, it ensures its sustainability to address also the weak points of the NBS. So I'm really looking now for forest and farm producers organization who would be interested to pilot this self-assessment tool with IUCN because we really want to make sure that it is user friendly but relevant for FFPOs and local communities that necessary changes in the language and in the process are taking into account and that well the entire process represents FFPOs needs. So this is a call for anyone who would like to pilot this in with with me. Voilà. Anna. Thank you, Pauline. Great. So I think, as I mentioned in the beginning, uh, this is the first uh, time that this is the first day that this initial the story map on IUCN's website, the change makers, uh, as in the forest and farm producer organizations behind forest landscape restoration is being launched. So um, Pauline, uh, it'd be great if we could um, get an idea of how to go and visit that as well on the website. Um, otherwise, the tool call for action, please uh, give us feedback on how useful this is and uh, give us your own uh, experiences. Next, we're going to turn to Florante Nonoy Villas in Philippines, and we will hear about a very concrete and uh, practical approach that has been very successful to mangrove forest restoration. So Nonoy, we, you have all of our ears. Uh, it's uh, good evening here in the Philippines. I'm Florante Villas and they call me Nonoy. It's my nickname. I'm the senior program manager of ACEDRA. And ACEDRA, as mentioned earlier by Nora, is a member of uh, AgriCord. And ACEDRA is working here in Southeast Asia. So my presentation actually is, is a supplement to a video 
that will be shown to you after this one. Uh, and the logos on this first slide uh, represents the, the partners that work with COMPASS. COMPASS is a coalition of uh, municipal teaser folks, smaller uh, teachers association at the uh, municipal and village level. And these are the smaller uh, logos at uh, the bottom are the local government units uh, providing uh, co-management agreement with COMPASS and its members. Next slide, please. So when uh, asked about the drivers of deforestation and degradation of mangrove forest in, in the Philippines, no? and in particular in the province of Sabuanga, the province of Sabuanga is located in the eastern part of the southern island of the Philippines. And uh, the drivers of deforestation actually are the previous centralized management uh, which uh, allowed the uh, degradation and deforestation of mangroves because of this uh, rampant establishment of fish spans for commercial fishing uh, in the production of milk fish and shrimps, including unregulated uh, coastal developments and human settlements. And of course, the illegal uh, cutting of timber for firewood, uh, production of charcoal, and some even exported to other countries for the production of rayon. Next slide, please. So the nature-based solution applied in this case is the reforestation, restoration, rehabilitation of deforested, denuded, damaged or destroyed mangrove forest. But this is combined with earlier the oyster production and then you have fish cage production and then aqua silvi culture and collective marketing of fish and seafood products. And this one I would want to emphasize that any nature-based solutions without a combination of uh, initiatives that provide economic and social benefits will not succeed. This is the experience of the earlier part of uh, COMPASS in, in years back. Next, please. So the important role of fishers and the organization in planning and implementing nature-based solutions. In short, it's actually putting them, no? uh, putting the fishers organization at the driver's seat. And, and and we as support organization taking the back seat and providing the, the, the advice uh, of business organization where to, to drive. So it's really the, the direct management of business organization in coastal resources. Second, uh, COMPASS and its member associations are legitimate actors you know, presenting the features who have the capacity to mobilize their members. So it's also part of the organization that also matures you know, and provide leadership. And in the case, in this case, COMPASS and its member organization uh, act as a legal entity to undertake a co-management agreement with the local government. Uh, this has a long history because before it was not possible, it was only possible uh, when the new fishery code of the and the co management agreement, which devolved the, some of the forest management functions to local government. And the local government can partner with a uh, fishers organization in the management of mangroves. So, COMPASS and its member association now in the province are officially recognized as the primary managers of mangrove forest, coastal resources, and some established marine sanctuaries. While the local government uh, provides policy, technical and material assistance to research organizations. 
Next, please. And in addition to the role that uh, peace organizations play, their members also provide labor time and materials in mangrove reforestation, restoration, and rehabilitation. Because it takes years yeah, uh, before a uh, mangrove forest matures. So the, the peacers themselves volunteers to replant mangrove and maintain and protect especially during the early stages of growth, you know, where uh, mangrove uh, species are uh, vulnerable. And uh, Pacers also has a range of expertise. They have a very intimate knowledge of the, the area <clears throat> in mangrove growth. They know about water currents. They know about the implications of high tide and low tide. They know about the navigational pathways, the currents, the identification of the seagrass, coral areas, etc. So the local knowledge is needed to ensure a successful reforestation, restoration, and rehabilitation. Next, please. So the key to success is the capacity of the thesis organization to bring together and mobilize their members towards this common goal. And the other very important uh, factor is the security of tenure that was being provided by the co-management agreement with local governments. This uh, policy was a result of long advocacy and lobby uh, by peace organizations and NGOs at the national level. And three, the clear benefits that's derived from the nature-based solutions. Peace already understood the impact, the negative impact of mangrove uh, loss. No? In, this includes the declining fish cuts. In the video, you will see later that previous uh, average fish cuts was small and it's steadily growing until present. Next, please. So the, the other benefits that is derived from this nature-based solutions is there is increased food uh, the increase in the volume of fish no, population provide uh, food security and it uh, facilitates a sustainable food systems. And because of that, it improves and sustains livelihood. It supports the vital ecosystem services and biodiversity. And it buffers them from disasters. And uh, also provide aesthetic beauty to the communities of fishers. Next, please. So what secures a long-term sustainability of nature resolutions? Uh, from this experience, it's uh, the continuous education and awareness building, uh, being, uh, being continually made by this uh, by compass and their members which even resulted to mobilizing former illegal fishers uh, forest poachers to join compass and in this case some of these uh, fishers are now uh, volunteer uh, sea wardens which they are tasked to protect the forest and run after illegal fishers and very important is the engagement and partnership with local government. And uh, in this engagement, uh, policies are enhanced and financial investments for maintenance of mangrove forests and marine sanctuaries, support 
for example, for volunteer peace warders, the equipment that they use, the patrol boats, the food, among others. And of course, the services of COMPASS to their members. Uh, most of the services are economic services, uh, technical support in the production of uh, fish, in fish farming, in seafood, in lobster production, sea bass, snapper, and in establishing aquasilvic culture. And also in, in gathering the, consolidating the products of uh, members and market it collectively. Next, please. So in order to expand uh, the results of this compass and scale up, investments are needed, especially in awareness raising of teachers, yeah? uh, organizing teachers and building the institutional capacity of their organization to be able to effectively engage government and provide supporting services to their members. These are uh, some of the very important uh, aspects in expanding the, the resource that COMPASS has made at present. Next, please. Uh, I think this is the last slide I've got in the pack. Uh, oh, yeah. Last. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. No so we have a video also from uh, Compass and Asidara, I believe. Yes, uh, one second, I'll just slow that up. of 52 fishers associations in the province of Zamonga, Sibugay, in the Philippines, with around 3,200 household members. It was founded on August 16, 2013. Comfas was organized in response to the dwindling fish catch due to continued mangrove deforestation and illegal fishing, affecting the economic conditions of fishers in the province. Comfas provides capacity building, extension services and technical assistance, processing of marine products, and marketing services to its members. Mangrove forest is important to fishers because mangroves provide breeding grounds for fish, shrimp, crab, and other shellfish. It is a shuttle of many marine species young commercial fish species before they go out to the open sea. It protects shoreline against damaging storms, typhoons, and erosions. It maintains water quality and clarity, and mangroves sequester carbon four times more than address the challenge of mangrove deforestation by reforestation. Currently, 9,000 reforested mangrove forests, 6 protected marine sanctuaries, and over 15,000 under Comfas members' protection and management. The reforested mangroves increase the population and the number of fish species in the municipal waters. Fishers have experienced increase in average fish catch per trip. Now, Fishing is no longer just extraction, but it also includes marine farming like fish culture and aquasilvi production. Policies and mechanisms are in place to prevent illegal and unregulated fishing. Sea wardens and vigilant communities which deter illegal fishing and cutting of mangrove forest trees, intrusion of commercial fishing operations, and forest poachers.
Members of CAMFAS are represented in local government development bodies. In these bodies, they engage in policy dialogue and lobby. CAMFAS, as a coalition of these fishers associations, became a united voice of fishers in the province. One of the best practices of CAMFAS is the requirement for an association to become a regular member to the coalition. An association is required to establish a track record of reforesting at least two hectares of mangrove before being admitted as regular member. But even with this tough requirement, Comfess is able to grow in membership. Another best practice is the establishment of community-managed nurseries for mangrove forest trees species. These nurseries make seedlings and planting materials to the forest mangroves easily accessible to members. Partnerships with local government units and managing mangrove forests is another best practice of CONFAS. These partnerships is formalized through a Memorandum of Agreement or MOA between the local government unit and CONFAS or its local member. The MOA serves as a legal basis for CONFAS interventions in the mangrove forest and allows government to provide financial and other support and services to CONFAS and its members. The identification, selection, and deployment of Bantay Dagat or Sea Wardens is also CONFAS's best practice. The local government unit the National Police and the Coast Guard train and deputize selected CONFAS members as sea wardens to patrol, report, and act on illegal activities in their areas of responsibility. The provision of livelihood and economic services to CONFAS members is one of the best practices of the organization. This has strengthened and sustained the work of CONFAS in mangrove reforestation protection and management, including other areas of community-based coastal resources management. ASHIDRA, under the Farmers Fighting Poverty Project, supports CONFAS with funding from EU and EFAD through AgriCord. We have shared four best practices of COMFAS. These practices are scalable. The building up of partnerships with local governments allows fishers to have binding relationships between their organizations and the local government. There is so much work to be done in coastal and mangrove resource protection and management. ASHADRA is committed to support CONFAS, strengthen its economic services to its members, to sustain CONFAS work to improve the well-being of small-scale fishers in the province today and possible in the whole of Zamboanga Peninsula in the future. At present, CONFAS standing production capacity for fish, grouper, snapper, and sea bass is 2.7 tons per production cycle. The demand from its current buyers is more than 7 tons. The major constraint is the supply of juveniles in the wild. Supply of juvenile is unpredictable. Comfas plans to establish a breeding, hatchery, and fish nursery station to address this problem. 
This facility will help ensure reliable and predictable supply of fingerlings. I'll turn it back to Anne. Great. Thank you, Nonoy. So um, I believe we have um, to test all of your um, listening skills. Uh, we've prepared a little Mentimeter exercise, a quiz to test you. So Michael, are, is this ready or should we? Uh, yeah, this is ready. I'll just bring it up on the screen um, and everyone should be able to join soon. Yeah. So here with um, Comfas, uh, we saw an excellent example of uh, this network of partnership that has been developed in order to support our members implement this specific nature-based solution. But the question is, which of the following project components do you think have required the most financial investment over the years of implementation of this specific nature-based solution. So I think if you have loaded your, yes, we see some answers coming in. Organizational capacity building in the lead followed tightly by mango restoration activities, which is picking up. Oh, yeah. Oh. Have we got the end of that? And the answer. Uh, could we see the, what might the answer be, Michael? Um, I believe the answer is uh, the first one there, organizational capacity building. Yes. So, Nonoy, um, you had the answer to this was uh, organizational capacity building. Could you tell us a little bit why? Because it takes years. It really takes years to build an organization. An organization cannot mature in one, two, three years. Uh, it's a constant, you know, uh, nurturing, building, educating, capacitating. So these are in cycles, you know, you don't stop doing this because new members come in, there are problems, uh, you have to solve. All this requires investments, and you have to investment invest on uh, community facilitators, community organizers, uh, and, and expenses in doing capacity building. It takes years. Uh, this the original uh, association was organized in two thousand one. The the first. Uh, local association and then it slowly organized another village another village and then in 2013 takes how many years that's 12 10 years yeah compass was compass as a coalition of these uh, small organizations on the ground and then so, you have to build again. yeah you have to build again compass capacity Indeed. So often when we talk about investment for nature-based solution, may, many people may be thinking mainly of the more uh, physical aspect of planting trees, of setting up uh, flood barriers and so on. But 
often forgotten is this crucial aspect of strengthening local organizations and the costs involved with that. And yet they are so important in making sure that this can happen and work. So thank you so much, Nonoy. And in talk, just an addition. And in talk, this is the component that has been forgotten by our donors. Mm. Yeah, exactly. Yes. By many, I think. Yes. So Fantastic. So um, going from one uh, key example of the importance of partnering in order to make nature-based solution happen, we will turn our uh, listening ear and eyes to Vietnam and to Tang, who is the national facilitator for the forest and farm facility, and also who is representing the Vietnam National Farmers Union. Uh, you have our attention, Tang. Yes, thank you, Anna. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Okay, that's good. Uh, good afternoon from Vietnam. Uh, we are very uh, happy to be uh, part of uh, CPA conference to join with uh, the meeting today. Uh, Vietnam Farmers Union and uh, MF team. We have uh, me, MF uh, facilitator, as uh, introduced by Anna and uh, Ms. Iwan, our senior uh, advisor. So now uh, we, we would like to share with you uh, about Vietnam Farmer Union collaborate with the uh, government agency to implement the NBS. Next slide, please. Next, yeah. So uh, as you know that uh, in rural communities, especially in uh, mountainous area of uh, Vietnam, many issues need to be uh, solved based on uh, nature or based on community. And the first thing I would like to say with you is that, uh, so now in many places uh, in uh, mountainous areas, forests and farm producers, they still abuse uh, a lot of chemical in uh, their production. So that the thing will also lead to soil and water pollution. And the second issue is that uh, deforestation uh, in uh, protected uh, forest. And uh, in addition to that, when we work with uh, farmers and uh, uh, rural communities, we realize that, we realize that uh, forest, many forest land uh, transfer to agriculture land. That's also um, big issues in mountainous area of Vietnam. And another uh, issue is that uh, Molo culture uh, plantation also um, affect to the rural community. And in the picture in on the my pre presentation on the right, you can see that the cinnamon needs uh, now uh, they are all eaten by the pests, but that uh, did not happen in the in the past. And uh, another issue is that. Uh, natural resources and uh, traditional culture uh, heritage now lose, losing and uh, losing. As you know that uh, before Vietnam, we have uh, 40, uh, 54 minor, minority group and we have uh, many traditional dance and song, but now become less and less. And another issue uh, I would like to mention here is uh, climate change uh, affect uh, so much on uh, We have a frozen video on Tang here. Uh, Yvonne, are you present? Can you help us pick up? Yvonne or Tang? If one of you hear us if you could please respond via the chat box or on the video
Okay, Michael, so we have actually from Vietnam, while we are getting ready uh, to reconnect Tang, could we show uh, the videos that we have from Vietnam? So um, we have four two minute videos that have been prepared by the different partners in Vietnam, starting with uh, the uh, uh, government uh, representative, uh, follow up with one of the key technical uh, partners for in within the university in Vietnam who supports the organic um, farming um, technical training and implementation and then two cooperatives who will be giving their own perspectives of how they are working together with the forest and farm facility and the Vietnam National Farmers Union to implement a host of different um, initiatives and production models, including organic farming. So here we have the first of the, the videos, which is the Vietnam National Farmers Union's director. So apologies, not the government, he's the VNFU director, uh, who will be giving us an introduction. Please, let's go ahead. Hi, everyone. I am Mai Bak Mi. I am the director's external office and international cooperation departments of Vietnam Farmer Unions and the director of FFF2 Vietnam. First of all, on behalf of Vietnam FFF team, I would like to thank you for giving us a great opportunity to participate in uh, the community-based adaptation meetings. I wish you all good health and the CBA meetings successfully conducted. As you know, CBA and nature-based solutions are action to protect manage natural to address societal challenges at the same time developments. Actually, there are things that we're doing quite well in Vietnam for FAPOs, such as we provide technical and skill trainings, extreme visit to successful forest and farm models, building agroforestry, organics, climate resilience models, etc. Vietnam Common has policy related to nature-based solutions such as sustainable forestry and agricultural developments, biodiversity conservations, organic agriculture developments, and sustainable poverty reductions. Vietnam Farmers Unions collaborated with the FFF program in uh, implementing activities to respond to challenges of forest-based farmers committees in four provinces, such as Sơn La, Hòa Bình, Yên Bái, Bắc Cạn, with seven ethnic minority groups in northern mountainous regions. Uh, we have farmers' organizations to develop and manage forests to combine agroforestry production to increase the value of income from forest, organic farming, and environmental protections, climate resilience, and traditional cultural preservation. This is what I want to share with you. If, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to discuss with us. Thank you and goodbye. Tôi là Trần Thị Thanh Bình, tôi đang là giám đốc trung tâm nông nghiệp hữu cơ, trực thuộc Viện Quản lý Đất đai và Phát triển Nông thôn, trường Đại học Nông nghiệp Việt Nam. Nơi tôi đang đứng đây là nhà A3 của trường Đại học Nông nghiệp. Chúng tôi rất vui mừng là đối tác của chương trình Rừng và Trang trại. Từ năm 2019 đến nay, chúng tôi đã đào tạo 32 giảng viên và hơn 200 thành viên trực thuộc hợp tác xã và tổ hợp tác. Học viên đến đây được đào tạo để hiểu thế nào là nông nghiệp hữu cơ, tại sao phải sản xuất theo nông nghiệp hữu cơ và các cái nguyên tắc tiêu chuẩn về nông nghiệp hữu cơ. Nông dân rất tích cực học tập và thực hành xây dựng các mô hình sản xuất nông nông nghiệp theo nông nghiệp hữu cơ, quản lý chất lượng theo tiêu chuẩn BGS, tiêu chuẩn TC Việt Nam, các, với các sản phẩm vô cùng đa dạng như lúa ruộng, lúa nương, bí thơm ba bể, các loại rau màu, cây ăn quả, quế, măng, mật ong, nấm và gà nuôi dưới tán rừng. Học viên được thực hành canh tác theo nông nghiệp hữu cơ, giúp người nông dân nâng cao thu nhập bởi chất lượng tốt, đa dạng, hóa sản phẩm, tiết kiệm chi phí đầu vào, 
Đặc biệt trong cái quá trình tập huấn thì bà con được hiểu thế nào là luân canh, sen canh, sử dụng phân ủ, thuốc thảo mộc, không sử dụng hóa chất nhằm bảo đảm sức khỏe của đất, hệ sinh thái và sức khỏe con người, từ đó nâng cao chất lượng cuộc sống. Mời các bạn đến thăm trung tâm nông nghiệp hữu cơ tại nhà A3, trường Đại học Nông nghiệp Việt Nam. Chúng tôi rất vui được mời các bạn đi thăm các mô hình sản xuất nông lâm nghiệp của chương trình rừng và trang trại do COA tư vấn và hỗ trợ. Thân mời các bạn. Trước đây chúng tôi sản xuất quế và bán quế thô cho thương lái với giá cả hết sức là bấp bênh và thấp nhưng hiện nay thì chúng tôi đã sản xuất được hai loại sản phẩm đó là quế và hồ hữu cơ để xuất khẩu sang các nước như Anh, Nhật, Pháp. Từ những năm 2015 thì nhờ sự hỗ trợ và tập huấn của chương trình FFF chúng tôi đã học và thực hành chỉ với 1,7 HA quế hữu cơ đầu tiên cho đến nay thì chúng tôi cũng đã sản xuất và phát triển được khoảng 600 ha quế hữu cơ với hơn 600 hộ nông dân tham gia. Các cái sản phẩm hữu cơ không chỉ mang lại cho chúng tôi về thu nhập được tăng lên mà còn cải thiện được sức khỏe của đất đai, hệ sinh thái rừng và đặc biệt là đối với lại sức khỏe của con người. Các cái thành viên của tổ hợp tác, của hợp tác xã và đã góp vốn đầu tư vào nhà máy sản xuất quế với và đến nay thì chúng tôi cũng đã tạo ra được 12 loại sản phẩm chủ lực đó là quế ống điếu, ống sáo, tinh bột quế và tinh dầu quế. Vấn đề về bảo vệ môi trường, cộng đồng trong sạch và không bị ô nhiễm hóa chất thì hiện nay chúng tôi cũng đã làm rất là tốt trong cái thời điểm hiện nay. Sản phẩm hữu cơ của chúng tôi có chất lượng cao hơn và được EU, Nhật Bản, Hàn Quốc chứng nhận nên giá tăng nên giá thành cũng được tăng lên từ 20 đến 30 phần trăm thu nhập của các cái thành viên cũng được cao hơn từ 15 đến 20 phần trăm và tạo việc làm cho uh, từ 120 đến 150 lao động với 70 phần trăm lao động là phụ nữ hiện nay thì nông dân xã và các cái thành viên của các cái tổ hợp tác uh, và hợp tác xã cũng đang mở rộng sản xuất quý hữu cơ uh, ở từ, từ các thôn 1, 2, 3, 4 và cây dâu tằm, cây thảo dược, nuôi ong, trồng dưa và các sản phẩm thủ công mỹ nghệ từ vỏ quế. Hợp tác xã của chúng tôi có 35 thành viên chính thức và gần 200 hộ liên kết sản xuất tham gia và trong đó là có hơn 150 ha rừng và 60 ha diện tích đất sản xuất nông nghiệp. Ở trong thời gian vừa qua thì nhờ sự hỗ trợ và tập huấn nâng cao năng lực của chương trình FFF, hợp tác xã Yên Dương đến nay đã có những sản phẩm đóng góp từ rừng mang lại giá trị kinh tế cho người dân, ví dụ như là tre, măng, cây thuốc nam, miến rong, gạo nếp tài, bí thơm. Và đặc biệt, Hợp tác xã Yên Dương hoạt động sản xuất gắn với lại việc bảo tồn, giữ gìn văn hóa truyền thống của người giao và cho du lịch lâm nghiệp cộng đồng. Ở trong thời gian vừa qua, thì FFF đã tạo chúng tôi đã đào tạo chúng tôi về phát triển rừng và nông lâm nghiệp bền vững. Ở thứ nhất là về canh tác hữu cơ và đa dạng sinh học, phát triển chuỗi giá trị và khả năng chống chịu với biến đổi khí hậu. Bà con nông dân chúng tôi dần dần thay đổi về thói quen năm tập quán canh tác, có kiến thức về nông nghiệp hữu cơ áp dụng tiêu chuẩn PGS và kiểm soát chất lượng nội bộ. Hiện nay thì hợp tác xã Yên Dương có những sản phẩm hữu cơ ví dụ như là như là gạo nếp tài, bì thơm, thuốc thảo dược. Sản phẩm hữu cơ đã đem lại giá trị kinh tế cao, nâng cao giá trị ít nhất là hơn 10 đến 20% nên nông dân có lợi ích hơn. Trong thời gian vừa qua thì hợp tác xã Yên Dương đã xúc tiến thương mại thị trường và có phân phối các sản phẩm hữu cơ, hợp đồng ký kết với lại các chuỗi cửa hàng thực phẩm hữu cơ như là chuỗi cửa hàng thực phẩm BB Green tại Vinh Nghệ An, chuỗi cửa hàng thực phẩm Thiên Phúc tại Vinh Nghệ An và chuỗi cửa hàng thực phẩm Healthy Lào Cai, hệ thống các siêu thị Vinmart, Vincom và một số cửa hàng hữu cơ khác. Chúng tôi đã xây dựng kế hoạch tiếp theo tiếp theo và sẽ tiếp tục trồng lúa nếp tài hữu cơ, rau theo mùa và bí thơm hữu cơ, rong giềng trong mùa vụ tới. Qua đó thì chúng tôi hiểu rằng thứ nhất là bảo vệ canh cảnh quan rừng thu được nhiều giá trị hơn là từ sản phẩm từ rừng của chúng tôi như là đồ thủ công mỹ nghệ tre đa dạng hóa các sản phẩm dựa trên hệ sinh thái. Phụ nữ và thanh niên có thể kiếm thêm việc làm và tham gia vào các hoạt động cộng đồng vì vậy đời sống kinh tế xã hội cộng đồng của chúng tôi sẽ được cải thiện hơn.
Yes, I am back. Can yes, me? please. Can you, can you hear me? We can hear you. Yes, thank you very much. And very sorry for disturbing. I don't know why, maybe uh, IT uh, technical problem. So you have a uh, watch and here uh, sharing of uh, VNFU and uh, organic uh, government agencies and uh, our FFPOs. They are sharing about uh, what we are implement, implementing uh, NBS in Vietnam and all the videos uh, made by the our FFPOs because of the COVID, we could not uh, go there to uh, make the video. So we ask them to prepare and we use what they have to produce and send to Hanoi. On this uh, occasion, uh, we would like to send our great thanks to our FFPOs. So through the videos, you can understand the policy of uh, Vietnam government uh, related to uh, laser based solution and how VNFU and FFF and our partners support FFPOs uh, to apply uh, organic farming and agroforestry. Uh, to, uh, so at this time, maybe you will question yourself that what and how we can do this. And uh, through this uh, diagram, I would like to explain further for you so that you can uh, maybe understand. Uh, so on the screen, uh, the diagram on the left hand, you can see the uh, blue dots. It's like uh, the indiv individual farmers. So when we work with uh, uh, rural communities, we try to organize uh, our individual farmers as a farmer group or, or co collective groups or cooperatives we call FFPOs to support them, facilitate, facilitate them to produce uh, forest and farm as a value chain and link them to, to the market. And as uh, you know that in the process of this, many related uh, things uh, to uh, uh, related to them, such as uh, governance and uh, legality, uh, research development, uh, business support, and technical advice also and also includes uh, uh, social organization and uh, finance for their production. So you can see the red uh, word here, we put here the linkage is the, the key. Uh, we not only link uh, our FFBOs to the market, but also link with the different uh, agencies, local and uh, national uh, government and different uh, departments. Uh, next, please. It is, uh, yes, so you can see some uh, phrase uh, appear here that to, to explain for you how we can do this. The first thing is we uh, organize farmer as a group and develop uh, organization uh, by capacity technical training and also we uh, facilitate them to policy advocacy. Uh, Uh, next night, please. Uh, so uh, after many years uh, of working with uh, communities and farmers, we have uh, some lesson learned is that the first uh, our lesson is uh, we use a participatory approach to work with farmers. It means that uh, we uh, try to, uh, to uh, work with them and uh, involve them in all the process of uh, development and uh, listen them carefully and uh, we use the uh, uh, bottom up not uh, uh, central uh, approach and the second uh, our um, lesson learned is that we uh, use the round table discussion as a tool uh, so the round table is Discussion is not a new new thing, but it's, uh, it's like a, a place for the farmers and FFPOs sit together with uh, different uh, agencies 
like uh, local authority, uh, multi-stakeholder, private sector to discuss and show the uh, difficulty and challenge of the FAPOs. It means that when we work with uh, farmers and FAPOs, we firstly, we uh, help them to identify their the difficult and challenge. And after that, we organize a roundtable discussion at the commune level to discuss and to solve uh, their issue and their problem. If something at the commune level we, we, lot, we do not uh, solve uh, FFPO problem. We will bring to the district level. It means that we will organize roundtable it, uh, at district level. At the same with this, if something uh, cannot uh, address at the district level, we will organize a roundtable at, at the provincial level. So through the um, many roundtable discussions, so many difficulties and challenges of uh, FFPOs uh, uh, was addressed. Uh, not, on, on, not only that, uh, through the roundtable discussion, we will also mobilize uh, many resources to support for the FFPOs so that their uh, income really generates and uh, their forest and farm uh, sustainable management. Uh, so the next uh, lesson learned is that uh, with this incubation and we uh, conduct um, uh, value chains uh, training and value chain approach, approach to link uh, them with uh, business development and uh, support them to be, become uh, more confident and uh, more income. And another lesson learned from our work is that peer-to-peer uh, -peer learning and exchange visit so that uh, through these activities farmers and FAPOs, they can share uh, their experience and their uh, creation with each other. Uh, next slide, please. And for coming time, uh, BNFU and FFF, we will uh, continue to support uh, our FAPOs to implement uh, laser base, such as uh, sustainable, sustainable forest and farm practice and we can establish uh, models based on uh, lecture solution to respond to the uh, challenge. And uh, we continue to uh, uh, implement uh, business incubation and training in uh, ecosystem base. And uh, also, as I mentioned, we will uh, try to facilitate to organize uh, policy, act, uh, policy advocacy activity and collaboration, collaboration with uh, government agents, agency and other multi-stakeholder to mobilize resource and finance to support for FFPOs. And another thing we really um, think that is very useful is uh, we enhance uh, communication on NBS and sustainable forest and farm management and production and business to protect and restore nature. And that's uh, what we want to share with you. Any recommendation and suggestion that are well, warmly welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tang. Great. So that was um, a fantastic example of how a producer organization of the scale, such as the Vietnam National Farmers Union is, uh, is able to support its members uh, through a very integrated approach, building on business incubation, policy advocacy, and technical assistance to help them scale up these different solutions. Thank you so much. So now we will go to our last case study today, and I do hope that you are all uh, following us in this, is we're going to Ecuador. So a very different context over to South America, and we will have on video presentation Virginia Vallejo Rojas, who is the National Forest and Farm Facility, Forest and Farm Facility Facilitator in Ecuador. So here is her presentation that she has prepared for us today, since it is too early in the morning. Good day with everyone. Greetings from Ecuador. In collaboration with a family farm organization from Ecuador called Edunacac, 
we will present the using nature-based solution to achieve the summa causa or good living in Quechua language with the nature. This is a history of UNARCAC in Ecuador. I give thanks to UNARCAC for the valuable support for this presentation. As a background, firstly, Ecuador is in South America. It is a country that has four natural regions, coasts, Andean, Amazon, and Galapagos Islands. The UNARCAC is in an, an Andean province, located in, in the north of Ecuador, a province called Imbabura, as we see in the map. The UNARCAC is the acronym of the Union of Indigenous Peasant Organization of Cotacachi. UNARCAC has 42 years of organizational trajectory and has 3,000 households that form 45 communities. This household managed an ancestral production model called Chakra. The communities of UNARCAC are in the buffer zone of Cotacachi Cayapas National Park. In addition, the territory that manage UNARCAC are in the process of an international recognition of GIANTS. GIANTS is a globally important agricultural heritage system. In this sense, uh, this international recognition is focused on a chakra system, an Andean chakra system, that is the production model of UNARCAC communities. The communities and people of UNARCAC are organized in various groups, such as weather boards or juntas de agua in Spanish, uh, women, uh, young, and producer groups. The production models, strategies, and ventures of UNARCAC are part of nature-based solution that UNORCAC do to provide human well-being and biodiversity benefits. In this slide, we show how UNORCAC manage resources to achieve summa causa. Firstly, summa causa is a Quechua term that is used by Quechua indigenous people to refer to a new form of citizen coexistence in diversity and harmony with nature and with cultural identity. In this scheme, the UNORCAM shows how the spheres of peace and organization, cultural identity, natural resource conservation, and economic development interact to achieve the summa causa as a process that is based in peace and organization that is the human collective action. The peace and organization sphere is composed mainly by organized groups such as cabildos, women groups, young groups, farmer groups, and water boards, or juntas de agua in Spanish. In this arena, we also show that UNORCAC is part from another major organization such as cantonal assembly, local government, and FENOCIN. Uh, this last is a national indigenous organization in Ecuador. The cultural identity sphere is composed mainly by cosmovision and traditional knowledge, indigenous health, gastronomy, handicrafts, and ritually. Uh, the natural resource conservation sphere is composed mainly by ancestral and sustainable production model based, based on agrobiodiversity, agroecology, uh, seed fairs, community water management, and environmental education. And the economic development sphere is composed mainly by strategies like microcredit, agroecological fairs, agrotourism, agroindustry beekeeping, and producer networks. These four spheres interact to achieve the summa causa. In this sense, we can view how this interaction constitutes the, the diversity of nature-based solution that UNORCAC performs. All of these nature-based solutions are performed by the human agency of UNORCAC, that is a collective agency and a collective uh, collective action that emerged from peace and organization. And that is the base of all interaction of these four spheres to achieve the summa causa. From here, we uh, briefly show through pictures the nature-based solution between each sphere of action of UNORCAC. 
Regarding to natural resource conservation sphere, UNRCAC has a nature-based solution which contributes to peasant family agriculture, food sovereignty, conservation of agrobiodiversity, tra traditional knowledge, uh, peasant enterprises, education in conservation of agrobiodiversity and food security. Also, uh, foster of agroecological and chakras, training and exchange for agroecological production, and foster of bio knowledge uh, center. Regarding uh, to cultural identity sphere, UNORCA has nature-based solution which contributes to maintain the Andean cosmovision. A representative ritual linked to cultural identity is the Muyurraime. It is an Andean festival that fosters cultural identity within, with, and between producers, consumers, policymakers, and another groups of society through several practices, such as fair seed exchange, exhibition of gastronomic heritage, gastronomic fair, uh, entrepreneurship fair, agroecological production fair. Regarding to economic development sphere, UNRCAG has nature-based solutions which contribute to generate incomes from different agri-food activities, such as peasant commercialization. In pre-COVID-19 context, the producer had a traditional freight with a several consumer in the same place. But with the COVID-19 context, the producer developed uh, new forms to perform commercialization activities. For example, using uh, virtual platforms like WhatsApp and Facebook, and implementing new forms of logistics uh, like home delivery. All of these new strategies are now implementing with biosecurity measures in order to save the health of all people and communities. These strategies are supported by Forest and Farm Facility in Ecuador. In this scheme, we show how a function the UNORCA commercialization found for the direct sale of agroecological baskets of products. We show the institutional arrangements that are the rules for fund operation, that are manual for the management of the fund, regulation for community fair, and biosecurity protocol under COVID context. The fund uh, began with the initial support of Forest and Farm Facility in Ecuador. This support provides liquidity to purchase agri-food products directly from producer at the farm. Then, two women facilitate the gathering, consolidate the basket of products, and plan efficient routes for home delivery. Finally, the basket of products are delivered directly to urban consumers. Here, consumers pay to the UNORCA, and the UNORCA recovers the money paid to producers and generate a surplus that is returned to the fund in order to provide a, a financial sustainability to the fund. Finally, another nature-based solution of UNRCA that contributes uh, to economic development sphere are the peasant microenterprise, such as Sumagniqui, focused on added value to native crops, Saramama, focused on traditional drink, uh, packaged uh, called Chicha de Jora, Mama Murukuna, focused on production and commercialization on, of Andean grains, Runa Tupari focused on agro-tourism, Asoproac focused on beekeeping production, and Osteria Cuicocha focused on community tourism. For all, uh, thanks and greetings from Ecuador and uh, from UNORCA. Thanks. Great. So, um, we're now coming to the end of the event, so uh, that was a very uh, different and interesting example from Ecuador. So we have now seen uh, one nature-based solution example from the coastal area landscape in the Philippines, turning to the forest and farm landscape in Vietnam, and then finally to the periphery of a protected area landscape in Ecuador. 
all of which em emphasize on the one hand sustainable uh, management of natural resources, but also the importance of strengthening entrepreneurship and economic development in those areas for local producers. So I hope we've given you a flavor of uh, some of the work that the Forest and Farm Facility and its partners are doing around the world. Um, as a last exercise, we hope to hear from you more um, in terms of how you have gauged this session together in a world clad cloud exercise. Um, any questions that you have also for Virginia, please post them in the chat box because we will forward them directly to you um, unless we can answer them ourselves. So, um, Michael, could you please um, help us to load just the final uh, word cloud before we close for today? Okay, so first question. I hope everybody has their Mentimeter um, accounts opened. Um, is coming back to the initial uh, session presented by Pauline from IUCN and the new nature based solutions self assessment tool. How do you think mapping and assessing progress on nature based solutions could be most useful for local communities? So if everybody could enter three entries starting from now, and you see the code to Mentimeter at the top of the slide there, 665076. Great. So we have three very equal entries. See if we can get some more. Whoa. Advocacy is coming out strong. So using a self-assessment tool for communicating to those who make decisions about the nature-based solutions being applied. Ensuring transparency is also coming out strong. Who is doing what and who can claim the right to benefit from it perhaps? Great. I think um, that's very clear. Um, we might, whoa, okay, capacity building and inclusiveness is also coming up to the race here. So I think we have two more questions that we would want to uh, load before we finish today. So transparency, inclusiveness, advocacy, and capacity building is coming out as top um, useful um, aspects of using this nature-based solutions tools. So our next question, what role do you see for forest and farm producer organizations in scaling up nature-based solutions at the grassroots level? So again, we have three options, three entries that you feel is a key role that forest and farm producers play in scaling up nature-based solutions at the grassroots level. Takes a lot of thinking, doesn't it? Here we go. Policy advocates, yes, linked to our previous reflection. Models of good practice, Educators, interesting, indeed. 
mobilization, traditional knowledge, advocacy is coming out strong, market access, peer-to-peer, -peer, strength in numbers, rights and governance. We see also piloting the standard, advocacy capacity building. Interesting. Okay, so we have three key messages emerging here. Four, capacity building advocacy, local knowledge is coming up here and policy advocacy. Great. I think those takeaways, we will go to the last word cloud. I can see a red thread here. <laughs> we have similar priority uses as well as roles for produced organizations in nature-based solutions. Finally, what three enabling conditions do you see for bringing nature-based solutions to scale? Three entries again. The trick here is to act fast and not think too much on feeling. Okay, local leadership, investment, big one. And as we've seen, there are particular investments that you may easily forget, but that are crucial to make these nature-based solutions happen. In particular into organizational strengthening and capacity building in various aspects. Partnership, leadership, local leadership, funding, investment, capacity building. Yes. I think we have a red thread here as well. Investment and capacity building is big contenders. Partnership, local leadership and policy, great. So with that in mind, um, I would like us to all perhaps, um, at least on behalf of the organizers, if we could all turn on our videos to say thank you to everyone. And we have Virginia here today now, I see as well. Great to see Virginia. Um, and so to remind you that we have the capacity to answer all questions that you may have. And so um, we will want to do that as well. So please do send us your questions. If it's not been in the chat box, then by email or on the chat box on the event page. So uh, get in touch and um, let us have any questions that you might have had that we did not get a chance to answer. Uh, for those who um, we have gone a little bit over time, so thank you so much again and have a fantastic afternoon and it was a pleasure to um, engage with you today. <laughs>